Why do you insist on jumping to the shot? Because I have a secret. Okay, that doesn't make sense, but do tell. It's Sunday. Well, that's not a secret. Everyone 100% knows that. Yeah, but did they know that because it's Sunday, we are we have our Echo Sunday online service right now. So I can almost guarantee that everyone that's tuning in today for our Sunday service does indeed know that it is our Sunday service. However, some people may not be watching on Sunday. Well, then I have six other secrets. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Well, in the small chance that this is news to you, whatever day it is, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Comment, let us know that you're here. Introduce yourself, make some new friends. We have two more secrets on top of that to share with you today. Firstly, spoiler alert, you're about to hear an amazing sermon from Carrie Garcia, founder of the Freedom Movement, author of the book, The Exchange, leader of Freedom Academy, which we recently hosted for a week here at Echo. She's an amazing friend to Echo, an incredibly powerful speaker, and it's truly an honor to have her. Get ready, this one is gonna blow you away. The last secret we have for you, living generously creates space for God to bless you. This is truly a secret to living abundant lives to the fullest, and we believe in it wholeheartedly here. We have all sorts of ways for you to give. You can um, head to our website, text any amount to 84321, or use the Church Center app. Be a part of what God is doing in the world. Thanks again for joining us today. We love having you as a part of our Echo fam. We hope you enjoy the Echo online service.
so thankful that there is joy in this house today, Lord Jesus. Father, your word says that your mercies are new every day. Father, we stand in that promise. We stand in your joy and your peace, Father. We love you. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.
series. There's so many reasons why we love it. During worship today, as we were singing Champion, I could not stop thinking about the stories that represent, are represented in this room right now. Looking at the transformation, looking at you stepping into freedom. Some of you, it's your very first time, and you're like, what am I getting myself into? But today, you get to hear from one of my favorite human beings, and you're going to hear a little more about her story. But as she shares, I want you to just open yourself up for the next 30 minutes and start allowing God to maybe rewrite your story, maybe focusing on things that you've avoided in the past and thinking ahead and thinking the future because God is a God who forgives. God is a God who rewrites our story, and it blows me away every single day that he uses normal people like us to give him the glory. Amen? So today we have one of our faves, Carrie Garcia. For those of you that don't know her, you are going to love her. A little background, Carrie and I met through the Instagram. It's crazy. Three years ago, Andy, my husband, was listening to a sermon he sent me the podcast and said, I just listened to this sermon. This woman sounds like you and reminds me of you, and you need to listen to it. I listened. I wept. I listened to it a second time, took notes. I end up finding Carrie because, you know, you're on a podcast. You're like, who is this person? I need to see them. I DM her, for those of you that don't know, direct message. It's like an email. You okay? slid into my DMs. I slid into the, slid DMs. Into the DMs. I sent her a message just saying, what you do matters. Yep. What you do is making a difference. You affected me today and keep doing this and you inspire me. What did Carrie do? Responded. <laughs> we start DMing. Uh, fast forward a month later, we're on the phone and this was three years ago. It has been three years in the making of me getting her here on the stage to share her story. 
Annie and I have had a crazy ride the past three years. When I was at some of my lowest points, Carrie's who I called, Carrie's who I messaged. And what she does is she's a truth teller. She's a freedom seeking person who teaches and has taught me what it looks like to live in freedom. She's inspired me what it looks like to be a woman of God that I can, I have something to say that God has given me a word. A lot of fears that I've struggled with for the past 20 years, I'm now doing and just facing that fear every day because of a person like Carrie. We have become friends with their entire family. We love Mario, Ryder, Rocco, and Roma's downstairs, and you are going to love her. This is the first time she's here, not the last. Everyone up on your feet and let's honor Carrie Garcia. So kind, so kind, so good of you. Wow. That was a good intro. Let's just make sure I'm on. Yeah, you guys can hear me? Okay, great. Wow, Christy. Man, first of all, this church is far from boring. I'll tell you that much. I was like, uh, we ready to roar. I mean, it's good, it's good. I, I, I am, I was thinking in the car this morning, I got up really early just to pray for all of you and was thinking about like how, really how long it has been that we've been talking about coming um, and, and coming together to, to just share. And not so much because it's like, let's get Carrie here, but really, you know when you meet people, and th there's a lot of people that I'm like-minded with. Like, there's a like-mindedness, and then you meet people that are like-hearted, and I call them the kindred. They're just like these, kin Anna Green Gables is my jam. So I'm like, you're kindred, you're my kindred spirit. Um, and she is, and, and, that, and that means that when I met Andy, he was, and, um, and Andy's a vibe, you know? Like, like he's fun, um, and 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 I'm like, I love these people, and how can I not love you? Because you are the direct representation of what God has planted in your pastor's hearts for years. Like, I don't think you understand, and maybe you do, but just as an outside perspective, that you might have come into these doors today thinking, you know, I came for the free childcare, it's a pretty good, you know, exciting environment. Um, maybe you don't even know why you're here and you just got dragged here. And either way, that you were prayed into this room, that there's something happening in this city and in this state and in this nation that you are a part of. And I hope by the end of this 30 minutes, which I do have a countdown clock, amen, because I'm a recovering Pentecostal, so we be here till lunch. Um, and all you'd be saved 300 times just to get me to stop talking. Um, but that you are going to understand by the end of these 30 minutes that together, collectively, God is doing something, but he's doing it through your individual stories. And um, so I just wanna ask you today, would you consider, just for the next 30 minutes, now 27, that you would go, whatever God wants to say, in my heart and in my life, I'm gonna be open. Even if you're skeptical, even if you don't believe what I believe or what maybe this church believes, you still belong here. You're here for a reason. And you walk through these doors to hear something from God. And if God is alive, which he is, he is ready to speak. And wouldn't it be awesome if you left today going, I heard from the God of all creation that that was possible and I that happened to me? Wouldn't that be awesome? Guess what? God's ready. He's ready to stop, talk. He's ready ready to speak. He's ready to share. This is what he does. And he does it all the time. We are so caught up in our own stories and our own narratives that the story is for everyone else that we miss out on the direct words from God that he wants to share. And all he's asking from you is openness. Will you be open to hear? This might mean that something might come up that's uncomfortable. And I want to clarify really quick that whatever feels uncomfortable, if it's moving you towards the presence of God and not into hiding, you're hearing the presence of God, you're hearing the voice of God when it's moving you towards healing, towards his presence, anything that moves you away from the presence of God, that sounds like condemnation or shame or, or where you just feel so bad about yourself and you want to hide, it's not the voice of God. So you just go, no. Nope. I wanna hear the voice that moves me towards healing, that moves me towards the presence of God. That's what I wanna to listen to. And we're gonna pray that over you, that you would only hear that voice today. So Jesus, we ask that you would come. 
We ask that you would come into this space, God. I believe that there is something that you gave me today, that there is something under the surface. It's right under the surface that is ready to just just plow through the soil to grow and bring life. That these people that you've brought into this room, they are hungry and they are ready, but there is just a layer of hesitancy that says, maybe I'm not the one, Uh, uh, maybe I'm not gifted enough, maybe it doesn't look like this. And, And there's just that little barrier. And God, I am asking right now that we don't shy away and create the barrier, but that we step into what you have for us that breaks the ceiling of this room, God. And that breaks it for your glory and for your kingdom and for your goodness here in the land of the living. So God, would you send your spirit? Lord, would you help me, God, to not have it be about what I want, my agenda, but that you would truly come and speak and that this would be a holy and sacred space. We praise you, God, for what you are about to do, what you are doing, what you have done. We ask that your kingdom would come here right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this whole theme, like, let's hear us roar, I love this. I, as as a louder person, um, I was like, yeah, I can talk about roaring. I started to think about all of my life, and I've always been a roarer. Like, I've always been loud. Like, the moment I came out, you know, I was just, like, ready to roar. I've been on the stage since I was five years old. I have been performing and entertaining for years. Roar is very close to me, but let me define really quick the differences between two roars. The roar that I had up until I was about 30 was a roar through the grid of anger and hurt and betrayal and confusion. Growing up in a pastor's home, we played the part really well. And my parents love God. Let me, let me establish that. But a lot of what we did was love Jesus through performance and not through honesty. So we would get up on a Sunday morning and we would, my dad would preach the word of God, but we didn't talk about what was going on inside our home, my mom's eating disorder and her mental illness. We didn't talk about the fact that my parents were in two separate rooms. We didn't talk about that. We showed up, we played the part, oh, we roared. And I think that even in those years of roaring, we roared and God still got the glory in the midst of our brokenness. People still came to know Jesus, but God is after your heart and he was after our hearts. But for me, I couldn't understand, why can we show up in church on Sunday? Why can my mom write so many notes? Why can my dad preach? But why are we not talking about the dysfunction and the pain in our home? And that kind of confusion as a truth teller made me want to roar. It made me angry. It made me want to speak out against it. And let me tell you something, prophets, truth tellers in a home where their secrecies are not welcomed. (laughs) They're quieted because I'm pointing out the things that are, are is nobody gonna talk about the fact that you guys aren't together, but on Sunday morning, mom's playing the egg shaker and dad's preaching a good message? Is nobody gonna talk about that? So instead of dealing with that, I wanted to roar so loud and those roars were not welcomed and so I had to numb it because I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do with the confusion and, and there is an enemy. And I know for many of you, you might be new to the church and we don't like, we like to talk about God and we like to talk about his goodness. We don't want to talk about an enemy, but let me tell you right now, if we don't know the battle in which is assaulting us and coming against us, you will be ever bound to it. And there's an enemy that knew this woman has a gift. She has a voice. She sees the truth and wants to name it. Don't you think that there was an idea that says somewhere in the midst of the kingdom of darkness, I need to silence this. So I began to numb. Numbing looked like addiction for me for almost 10 years of my life. That was many years ago, but let me tell you something. Addiction was not my issue. It played itself out in being addicted to meth, but addiction was not my issue. A broken heart was my issue places that needed to be tended to, a gift that God had given me that has been assaulted because there was no safe place to actually talk about what was really going on. And so for years, I lived numbed. 
Once I decided to get off drugs, I was like, I'm going to either die or I'm going to live. And I decided I'm going to get off drugs and I know what I'll do. I'll go into ministry because healthy people are in ministry. (laughs) That's what I witnessed my whole life. And I just began to perform. I never dealt with why I did drugs in the first place. I just got off of them, changed the behavior. I'm going to change the behavior, change my life. Didn't work. Because the problem was his ministry just became the addiction. What you thought about me became what filled me. How you applauded for me became my source of, uh, 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 of gifting and my source of, of, of life and my source of my roar. So as I would get on a stage those many years and I would preach, which is a gift that God has given me, but the fact is, is that the places of my heart had not been tended to. I roared from my insecurities and I roared for the people pleasing and I roared for you to love me. And at 27 years old, I couldn't roar anymore. As my marriage was in shambles, my life was falling apart, I'm sitting in an apartment by myself with a stamp that said disqualified. I've done everything that you are not supposed to do as a good Christian. And the whispers began. It's better if you weren't here. It would be better if you weren't here. Silence your roar. I remember sitting at the stop sign, calculated, which is funny because I'm terrible at math, but when the lies are swirling, all of a sudden I'm Einstein. And I'm sitting at the stop sign and there's a bus and I know the bus and I know the bus schedule and I know how it works and I know the velocity of how fast this bus needs to go to hit my car so that this could all be over. And I'm sitting there weeping, angry, not understanding how a God that is supposed to love us could cause and have such damage. Everything was gone. My family wasn't talking to me. Marriage is in shambles. Life is falling apart. Ministry's gone. And the voice is swirling. It'd be better if you weren't here. End it. And then there was another voice. And it was not a roar. It was kind and it was gentle and it said I've seen everything you've done and if you turn this car around I promise you you will roar again but it will be for me so I turned the car around and I wish I could say you know I had like all this faith I had like I'll give you one shot <laughs> And I started the journey of several years of going to therapy and dealing with my story. I was praying for you. And as I was praying for you, I was like, God, what do you have for this church? What do you have for them collectively? And as I said in my prayer, I felt like there's this layer, like a thin layer right over you. And all of you are here, planted, ready to plow through the soil, like burst through the soil. And the whisper that I got from the Lord for you, you don't know how amazing your roar is yet, but it is ready, it is ready. Teach them, Carrie, to be unified in their gifts. Teach them to not be afraid, teach them to stand and bloom. When I was looking at the scriptures and I was thinking about roaring like collectively, the Lord said they can only roar from their reference. That we roar from our reference. We roar from our frame of reference. And you have two choices in how you will roar. Because trust me, you're all roaring. We see it on social media. We see people roaring, right? But you have two choices of how you will roar. You will roar in the hands of God or you will roar in the hands of your pain. Those are your two choices. And trust me, you might go, I'm an introvert. I don't roar. Oh, you roar because when your husband says it's time to go, you go, hmm. We'll see. That's roaring, okay? So you introverts don't get off the hook because us extroverts get all the slack because we roar loud but so do you. 
My husband is an introvert, and let me tell you, he may be quiet, but boy, that brother can roar at me. <laughs> See me walking up the steps like, mm-mm. I'm telling you, we all roar. The choice will be, will you roar from your brokenness or will you roar from your freedom? Will you roar from your reference? So I think when you roar from your frame of reference, the question is, what reference are you allowing yourself to roar from? And collectively, we want to do this. We want to come together. The series before was hear me roar, and now it's hearing us roar. And as God brought me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you have your Bible, which you should, because the word is alive and living, and you shall read it. So I know you want to get on your app, which you can, no judgment, next week bring your Bible, but no judgment, but you get on that phone, you're going to see the little card that says, hi, Instagram, you have a notification, and you're trying to read the word, and then you're checking out your DMs. I'm just saying, get your Bible, okay? Because I could be lying to you. You got to fact check me. You got to go home, be like, is that what she really said? And you need me to look it up because context is important. Anyway, I digress. I only got 15 minutes left. Oh, boy. <laughs> now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, we're going to move to verse 4, chapter 12. Now, there are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. Now, listen to this. A manifestation of the spirit is given to each person. How many people? Each person, right? Amen? For the common good. He goes on to say a bunch of the different gifts that will be given, and it says in verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also in Christ we are baptized by one spirit into one body. Now, I was looking at this, and, and, and this is about the gifts of the Spirit. This is about what God gives you as gifts. And, and so for many of you, you think, I don't have a gift. I don't know if I have a gift. God said, each body gets a gift. Each person gets a gift, and we got to work together. He goes on to talk about, if you're a hand, don't be like, I wish I was an eye. If, I was a, if you're a mouth, I wish I was an ear. Like, it needs a whole body. And it's talking about this, and I was thinking about this in relation to Echo Church and the understanding that why are our gifts not flourishing? And the reality is, is because gifts only grow in really good soil. They only grow in the places that are really been tended to and healed. Now your gifts in the hands of your pain will cause destruction. You know it. I am gifted at communicating. And let me tell you, for a very long time, my gifts were in the hands of my pain and it hurt a lot of people. But the more that God tended to the soil of my heart, those gifts, that th those talents moved into the hands of God and into freedom. And those gifts actually began to bring life on the planet and on the earth. So how do we begin to, to allow that oil to grow gifts that combine us together? You have to start understanding that you have a story. That you have a story that has had harm come against it. And those places of harm have begun a narrative, and that narrative says things like, you're not good enough, you're not talented enough, you don't speak like Carrie, you need to be more like that. And so what do we do? We minimize our story, I don't have a story, or we blow up our story, my story's too big. And we start to minimize or shove it or push it down, and we go, well, behold, I'm a new creation, all that's gone, and I'm just brand new. And that is true in the essence of what it is, but you still have a story. And here's what I want to tell you. When we don't tend to the story, when we minimize it, we miss the particularities of our giftings. Good. And so what God is saying here is not we need to work individually apart from each other. We need to work individually with each other. So when you hear us roar, you're going to hear me roar like this, and we're going to hear the worship guy roar like this, and we're going to hear the admin roar like this. Move. You're in the way. Administrate this place, please. And I'm going to go thank God for you, because I can't administrate my way into this room. But we minimize it, don't it? Don't we? And the Bible says right here in 1 Corinthians, as it says, it goes on, it says, do not, uh, do not be ashamed for what you have. Don't think any less part of your body. Because if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? 
And I think what I want to speak on behalf of you guys is that when we deny the places of our story, when we deny the places of where we are, we're actually going to roar in the places of our pain. We will not roar in the places of our freedom. See, God wants to take your story. He wants to take those places where you were on the playground and people were making fun of you. Or the day you came home and you were talking about how you don't want to play sports anymore and your dad looked at you and said, no boy of mine will ever not play sports sports. So suck it up and be what I need you to be. And whatever was alive in you died. And what God is wanting to do is give you the courageous acts to remember who he created you to be so that you can be in to roar from a place of glory and goodness and not a place of pain and destruction. Everyone's roaring. And everyone is roaring, not everyone, but a lot of people are roaring through their pain. What will happen if people come into these doors and the collective roar is saying, you are loved and you are welcomed and we're a mess, but there is a good God and I am not going to minimize my story anymore. I'm not going to say my story is not important. I'm just going to serve God and stand here and hope his Jesus juice lands on me. No. No that you have a story and that story is particular to your calling. Do you think that there is a, like the enemy didn't attack me in like gambling. I'm too obsessed with making sure I have pockets of money. I'm never giving it away. That's another problem I need to repent of. No, he started to attack me in the very places that I'm gifted in. He wanted to silence that because he knew that if I stepped in to the very particularities of my gifting and my calling as a collective whole, we would change the world. It happened with 12 idiots. I mean, really, if you read the Bible and you ever think, I don't know, stories for everybody else, just hang out with Paul for T minus two seconds. Peter, knucklehead, knucklehead. So what keeps us? What keeps us from this collective war? What keeps us from being apart? There's three areas that I just want to highlight. There's many areas, but I want to highlight three areas. Fear. We will be rejected. Our story's too much. It's not enough. If I begin to open up my story, I will stay stuck there. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world, and God is faithful. He says, I'm faithful to complete it. I don't believe so much that that means that he's faithful in the context of the scripture. I don't believe that when that scripture says God is faithful to complete it, that he means that he's faithful to complete the building of your business, you buying that next car. Now he might be all about that. What he's faithful to complete is his work in you. So if he's inviting you to open up a place of your heart where you're trying to control, where anxiety is riddling, where fear is just at an all time high, you can barely move and you feel stuck. That is a spirit of fear and you have authority over it. And you can say, wait a minute, what is keeping me stuck? He's going to invite you into a memory. He's going to invite you into a place in your story where that talon latched on in fear. And you began to believe a narrative that if I show up, if I speak up, if I move, I'm going to be rejected. So just stay small. Stay quiet. Don't tell the truth, Carrie. Because if you tell the truth, you will not belong. And we want to belong. We want to fit. My whole life is stories of trying to fit in. I mean, I have been emo. Nobody understands me or my music. I was in three quinceañeras. I mean, I was Mexican by association. <laughs> then I married a Mexican. I was chola. I had big hair, black lip liner. <laughs> and I was in a quinceañera. Actually, quinceañeras are awesome. If you are Hispanic in this room, y'all know how to do a 16th birthday. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but. I was so many different things, trying to find who I was, trying to belong, trying to fit in. And here's what is beautiful about the collective body of Christ, that God says that the manifestation of his spirit lands on each one of you. And as each one of you, it lands, you come together as a body and we go, oh my gosh, we needed a hand. We needed a mouth. We needed an ear. And you go, oh my gifts, that's just, it's just so dumb. And I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke it because here, I, I'm not a hand. I, I, I'm a big mouth. I get it. 
But a big mouth without a body is a clanging gong. It's a bull in a china shop. It's untended to. Your parts come together with my parts and it says, hey, I'm going to bring balance. We're going to bring goodness. Together we're going to link arms and we're going to move forward. This is the beauty. And we're not a wall where others can't come in. We are with open arms. Red Rover, Red Rover, bring them right over. And they come in and they join what we're doing. And they get to be a part of it. And they go, I have a family. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to be in so many quinceañeras anymore. I don't have to be emo. I don't have to be what we called mod in the 80s. I don't have to be a stoner. That was wild. I was for a while. I was a stoner, let me tell you. <laughs> I was really in. I was a hippie for a year. I'm telling you. Me and the dead, we hung out. I had a conga. It was a whole thing. I was all kinds of things. But when I stepped in to the body of Christ, fully understanding who I was created to be, yes. fear dissipated. Number two is that shame. We are so caught in shame about our story that we want to hide and that people will see us, that, that I'm going to be a fraud, I'm going to be exposed. I'm going to tell you right now, don't fear exposure because just like the woman who was caught in adultery, as she is exposed in her nakedness, Jesus stands in front of her, defends her, sends away her accuser, looks her in the eye and says, where are your accusers? Have they not condemned you? No, my Lord, I've not condemned you either. In kindness of his heart, he says, now you have the choice. You are no longer bound to why you are sleeping with this man. You are now free to not have to walk in sin anymore. Shame dissipates in exposure, and we want to hide it because the enemy says, don't you expose that. God won't love you. You need to have more faith. You're supposed to be a good Christian, and he keeps you hidden with fig leaves trying to pretend that nothing's happening, and Jesus is saying, come, bring your brokenness, bring your exposure, bring the hurt, bring the pain. Let's start doing the actual work of transformation rather than you just moving to all these behaviors, trying to just fit in, be the right one. Now I'm an addict. Now I'm a pastor. I don't know who I am. And he goes, no, no, no. You're my daughter. You're my son. And I have a gift on your life. Last one, third one here is envy, comparison. You see, I think if we want to roar from our reference, so many of us are trying to roar with someone else's voice. They're trying to roar like, I should look like that. I should be like that. I should say that. You know, they're writing a book. Maybe I should write a book. I don't like writing, but maybe I should write a book. No, don't write a book. I should speak because really good Christians, I know if I was really good Christian, I would do worship because worship leaders, you know, I mean, come on. Not, to, not today, Satan. <laughs> the reality is, is that so often we are fighting against our own narrative that says, I must be someone else, so I'm going to try to roar like them. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't land authentically. And when the lights are out and no one's around, you can feel it in your body. I was made for more, but just be quiet. I was made for more, but just look like them. I was made for more, but I'm so messy, and I'm looking at you going, it is your mess in the hands of God that qualifies you. It is not what disqualifies you. It is the very thing that qualifies you. I'm not standing here because of all my certificates and degrees and all my things. I'm standing here because I was a girl at a stop sign that thought I was disqualified because my life was in shambles. And it was in that moment, in that exposure, as I turned the car around, that I took a journey with Jesus to begin to remember who he created me to be. Then, and only then, does envy not have its play. That fear begins to dissipate and shame has no place. So how, lastly, right here, how do we begin to actually face off these places? Carrie, I love what you're saying. I, I, I do believe that there's more for me. There are places that I feel ashamed of. There are hurts that I'm experiencing, but what do I begin to do? I know you guys a couple weeks ago talked about the woman at the well. Just watch how it's been modeled. I won't turn there, but you can go and look in John chapter four. Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman and he does five things. Five things happen super quick. 
Number one, what do you need to do to begin to walk into your story, into your giftings, to create soil where you can thrive? One, you have to face it. What is it? What is it that's keeping you stuck? What's the lie? I'm speaking to you young ones too. If you can get this now, sweet girls, and understand what you were created for, that you will not let the enemy minimize you or lie to you. Honey, you're going to have a lot better than me. So you're going to get it. You're going to be like, not today, Satan. I remember that crazy blonde girl. I'm made for goodness. And the reality is, is that we have to actually face. So often I was taught, just give it to God, forget it's not there. It's a lie. This is what God says. Face it. Look at it. The Bible says, examine everything, look at it. What am I believing? What am I thinking? What's the memory that keeps rolling around in my head? And you go, this is so ridiculous, but I have this memory from the time I was five and and it just keeps coming back. And it's this time with my dad. It's got a, a hold on you. There's some kind of narrative that was there. And Jesus is saying, I'm revealing it to you to free you from it because I wanna give your brain, your body, another opportunity to look at it differently now to tend to it. So we got to face it. And then we got to name it. We got to look at it. And then we got to name it. What is it? Fear. Great. What else? What's beneath the fear? What are you actually fearing? The belonging, the tending. What am I fearing? I'm fearing rejection. Find the words and name it. Thirdly, you need to allow God to come into it. I was taught that you just give it to God. I have whatever it is. I don't really look at it that much because it's like, just have more faith and I just give it to God. I'm going to challenge you in the scriptures. This is not what Jesus did with the woman at the well. He actually had her face her shame. He stood there, where your husband, go bring him. She's like, I don't have a husband. He's like, you don't have a husband. You have five husbands and the guy you're living with is not your husband. And I'm like, savage, Jesus, whoa. And the reality is, is he wasn't doing that to bring shame. He was doing that to free her because whatever is in darkness must come into the light. It must be named. And as he named it, what did he do? He began to tend to her. I have living water for you. I want to give you a new life and a new hope. And he began to pour into her. And as he began to tend to her, she was able to begin. And this is the hardest one for the church. And I have one minute to share with you about the idea of repentance. I will never be able to do it. But it is the best word outside of salvation in the Bible. And look how much the enemy has ruined the word repentance. Because all we think of is the people standing on the corner. Repent or you're going to hell. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, so aggressive. True, but aggressive. But the reality is, is repentance, repentance as, as the prodigal, as he's sitting in the slops with the pigs, he's going, I have, there's got to be something better for me. My father has all of this. And the prodigal then looks at his, the slops and he goes, I'm going back. And what happens? The father runs to his son as he's coming up. Repentance is the invitation to the party. Repentance brings you back into the arms of the Father. Whatever is keeping you bound, whatever is keeping you stuck, you name it and you face it and you allow God to tend to it. And now all of a sudden, you're no longer bound to it. Then you start to walk in freedom. You start to walk into the party. You start to go, oh my gosh, I get a seat at the table. And he goes, not only do you have a seat at the table, and this is number five, but now you get to use it. You see, as the woman was tended to, the man with legions of demons, he goes, man, I want to go with you. You just freed my life. And he goes, you can't go with me yet. Why? Why can't I go with you? Because I need you to go. So if he's going to, if this world is going to hear us roar, they are not going to hear you roar by someone else's voice. They're not gonna hear you roar by an inauthentic relationship with God that stuffs everything that's real and pretends to be something you're not. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't sign up for that kind of faith. Don't walk in that kind of, it's not faith. It's religion and God hates it because he wants your heart. So I have so much for you. I have so much goodness for you. And so as we're like closing here, I just feel the stirring of, the, of, the, of God against what the enemy is trying to say. As the worship team just comes up and, and we're just going to go into a time of prayer. Just for a second. I'm a few minutes over. I apologize in Jesus' name. Here's what I'm sensing. You have some stories. You have some places where... It's like you're, you're like this. I don't have my mic, so I'm going to do it, show you. 
please come closer, stay away. And that stay away is because you have had people come close and they've hurt. You've had circumstances where you tried to trust God and it didn't go how you thought. And so faith has filled, feel hard and, and stepping into community and roaring from a place of victory feels hard. And let me just tell you, victory never looks like perfection. It looks like an honest place with the Lord that says, I am imperfect, but you are good. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear. And fear, when he says you don't have to fear, it means that there's fear. And he's telling your heart, my rod and my staff will guide you. So as you close your eyes, as you just allow yourself just this last minute, this last second before we go into this song, just the quietness of your heart, God, what is it? What do I need to bring before you? What do I need to invite you into? What have I been pushing aside? Is it my busyness? Is it needing to be successful? Is it, is it what my parents think of me? Is it what the world will think of me? Is it my body or my talents where I think it's just not enough? What is it, God? And what story is that attached to? Would you reveal that to them right now, Lord, in your name? Rochester needs a place that is safe. Rochester needs a place where people will love others from an even playing field. No one higher, no one lesser. All the body. There's so many body parts out there that we need in this room, that we want in this room. God, would you incite a roar? a holy discontent that begins to fire inside the men and women of this room in their bellies, that begins to look at the world and say, no longer on my watch will this continue to happen. I will speak out of the goodness of God from the depths of my pain and my story. And my gifts will begin to flourish for the kingdom of God is at hand. God, I pray a blessing over Echo Church, but I pray a fire in the bellies the hearts of the men and women that are here. We no longer will live in silence bound by our shame and our envy and our fear, but we will take it before you, God. And as you tend to this soil, may you rise up an army of goodness and surely we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living through his people in this room. Rochester is in your hands, God, but we are the conduits of your voice and your love. Our roar must not be quenched. It must rise from the depths of our story and the depths of our pain in the hands of God to reach a lost and dying world. And maybe the person in this room isn't ready to go out because they need you to come in. So if there's anyone here that does not know you, Jesus, and this whole thing feels kind of over the top, but there's something inside their belly that says, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know about a Jesus that wants me to be a part of a family. I want to know about a Jesus that takes me from the slop into the feast and welcomes me to the party. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord over your life, you will be saved. We confess our sin, our brokenness, our lostness, our control unto you. I ask you to come into our lives. And lastly, for those that have known you for many years, they've sat in the church, they've taken all the notes, they've sang all the songs, they've helped at all of the events, but to roar is to live fully alive and they have not tasted what it means to live fully alive. Would you go into the places that are keeping them bound and let repentance rise up as the beautiful word it is that says, welcome back, sweet child. Remember and bring to their mind who you created them to be and may a holy discontent for what the enemy is doing on this land rise up inside each and every one of us, linking arms together, Red Rover, Red Rover, send their hearts right over, we're ready. In Jesus' name, amen.
Will you stand with us as we worship this morning?
kind of love Somehow This kind of love is who you are It's a grace that could never add And that's the truth. Jesus loves you as he's found you. Before you were lost, you were found. So many scriptures that re reiterate that God is our Father. And we are his sons and his daughters. And some of you, you feel distant. You feel far from God. You feel lost. And today is an invitation to walk away from the slop and to walk into the feast, as Carrie said. And so today, just as we do every week, we invite you to pray a prayer that's not the end all, it's not the be all, but it's the beginning of saying, Lord, I'm going to live in a place of surrender. I'm going to acknowledge that we cannot do life alone. We need you. And so I want to invite those that have not prayed a prayer like this to pray this for the very first time. But yet, for many of us, this is just a reminder of a prayer and a posture towards God as we allow him to do his work in and through us. Church, let's pray. Jesus, I surrender. I have more questions than answers, but I choose to follow you anyway. I acknowledge that you lived, you died, and you rose again, all with us in mind. I accept the rest you the offer. Save me and lead me in Jesus' name and his authority. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, let's celebrate with those that might have prayed that for the first time or the first time in a long while. So. I don't know if you caught this, but a helicopter went over the castle. Thank you, Mayo One. And I actually think that that's what shot out her frequency and her mic. And as that was happening, I felt like the Lord wanted to reiterate that some of you have just lost the frequency. You've lost your frequency. And a lot of times why that happens in our life is because we allow the messages to kind of hang above us. And that message that's put above us, that's like mockery, shame, fear, it begins to kind of just, it interferes with what the Lord wants to do. And today is an invitation, yes, for the rescue, but more importantly, into the restoration, that God wants to repurpose your story. Now, some of you are like, you've been talking about story a lot. Let me tell you what it means. You're calling. The greater purpose that God has in your, in your life, you're not here by accident, you're here for by purpose. And that voice is meant to be heard, but it's also meant to be in tune with the frequency from heaven, amen? amen. And so today, some of you, man, you've got that message of mockery. I think about Jesus as he was put upon that cross. It was a message of mockery that was put above him, but it did not defeat the purpose that God and Jesus came here to do, amen? That's why we're sitting here 2,000 years later, because Jesus said, doesn't matter how much you mock me, I'm gonna overcome that message. And that's what today was all about. And man, I am so thankful for Carrie. Can we just celebrate Carrie and her heart, her message? But I just wanna say, we love you. Echo Church, let's not just be a people that attend a church, but truly be the church, amen? Have a great week, we love you guys.